we'll see that now as you look at verses 20 and 21. So I said, it's, here's the life, crazy radical life. Here's the purchase of the life, the blood of Jesus. And now here's the Father through Christ working the life in and out of his people, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, that's God, that's our Father, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. And now here's what he's praying that God would do. Equip you with everything good that you may do his will. That's what Jesus purchased. That flow of power. Everything you need bought by the blood, worked by the Father, equipping you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us, there it is, that's why I'm getting the phrase work in, work out, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. That's the Christian life. Through Jesus Christ, that's why I said the Father working it through Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. So the radical Christian life of Hebrews 13 is purchased by Jesus, worked by the Father, equipping us with everything good that we may do all that crazy, wonderful, beautiful, loving will and enabling us to please the Father. So don't just walk out of here. I mean, people, you can't stop people from misunderstanding, but I'm trying to help. Don't walk out of here saying, whoa, that was heavy. Let me look at six verses again. That's a lot. Got to screw up, got to screw up my willpower and do it. If you say that, you're not paying attention. Blood was shed so you wouldn't do that. Rather, how does it work? Okay, if it's not just screw up your willpower and make those first six verses happen, what's the alternative? In other words, how does verse 21 work? I mean, you're saying God is doing it. You're saying he's doing it through Christ. Help me, I mean, like for three o'clock this afternoon, what will it feel like? There's an answer to that in this text. It's beautiful, it's one of my favorite passages. So pose the question now to verses one to six. Okay, verses one to six. You tell me not to love money. How am I gonna do that? You tell me not to get in bed with the wrong woman. How am I gonna have the wherewithal to resist that massive temptation, right? You tell me not to close my door to a stranger. That's, how can I do that? You tell me to take the risks of love and the answer is in the middle of verse five. Your head's going down? Not every head is going down. So here's how you overcome the love of money and its control on your life, and by implication, the control of sex on your life, the control of fear on your life. Four, be content, be content with what you have. And that little word for or because is everything. It's, this, this verse is one of those precious verses in my life. For he has said, John, I'll never leave you. You, you preach that to yourself in the morning. You preach that to yourself walking into a difficult situation. You preach that to yourself facing a temptation that's almost impossible to, to resist. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. 
I'll always be for, for you, there for you. Yes, I will. So you don't need to be afraid. You can say, what can man do to me? Amen. What a life. What a freedom. What a joy. I mean, verses five and six are about the best in the Bible. I mean, I've got a lot of best in the Bible. <laughs> We break the back of sin's deceitful promises. That's the only way sin has power in your life, right? It promises you something. Sex is a promise. Riches are a promise. Safety in your home is a promise. Sin is always making promises. How do you break the back of deceitful promises? With better promises, that's how you do it. That's what the text says. We got better promises here. You break the back of sin's deceitful promises by believing in superior promises. That's the alternative to willpower. You get it? So you don't walk out of here saying, okay, got to do those six things. The battle is not willpower. The battle is, do I trust him? <laughs> do I trust him? He'll be with me. He'll take care of me. He'll never leave me. He'll give me everything good working in me. That which is pleasing in his sight. What could be better? You believe it or not. That's the battle. So, don't be afraid of strangers. Don't be afraid of prisons. Don't be afraid of sexual chastity, single people, for the next 50 years. I mean, the whole world is telling you, you cannot live a life without sex. You can't. You can. You can. This way. You don't be afraid of a lifetime without sex or staying with one woman, one man, as long as you both shall live. You don't be afraid of going outside the camp. You just don't be afraid. You don't be afraid. You trust him. You look at the blood, you look at the blood, and you say, that much he's committed to me. That much. Look at him, look at Jesus. I mean, I got people in my life I want to be saved like crazy, right? I'd die right now in a minute for their salvation. And when I think about it and pray about it, I say, open their eyes. Look at Jesus. Just look at Jesus. How can you turn away from that kind of suffering love? And that's the way Christians live their lives. He, he's committed that much to these promises. So we're at the last point. What has all this got to do with leadership? <laughs> What's this all got to do with David Livingston and Karen? 52 years, 35 years. Three times, I mentioned them, I'll read them now with you. You can read them with me because they're really rich. They have a lot to do with South City's church or the churches you all come from. Hebrews chapter 13, verses seven and eight. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their faith and imitate the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Number two, verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Man, that weighed on me for 33 years. This is a big church. We always said, this is a big church. I mean, pastors will give an account for souls, members, not hangers on, who never make a commitment, but you, you unite to a body, your pastor gets another weight on his back. Let them do this with joy. <laughs> Such a weight. Come to me, all you who labor, take my yoke upon you. It's light. It's easy. 
Let them do this with joy, not groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And then finally, verse 24, greet all your leaders, greet your leaders, all your leaders and all the saints. So let's just take those one at a time as we close. One, verse seven. Verse seven pictures leaders who evidently have died or gone all, away because it's in the past tense, right? Remember, spoke, they spoke, they're not speaking, they spoke. The outcome of their faith implies it's over. I mean, you can watch where it went. Where did it go? Where, where did it go out? So evidently, significant leaders had passed off the scene. Tim Keller, Harry Reeder, Donald McLeod, Paul Eshleman. I, was, I, mean, I could hardly, it was, a, it was a dying week for evangelicals. It was a dying week. One day, Tim, one day, Harry, one day, Donald McLeod, Scottish theologian. One day, Paul Eshleman, the leader and the designer of the most translated film in the universe, the Jesus film. Not to mention Nancy Nelson, and others you know perhaps. It's a dying season for me, for friends. So evidently that's happened in this church. And what he tells them to do is remember what they spoke and remember how they lived. Do that. They lived a life of faith in God's promises and they practiced what they preached. They preached the word, they lived the word. That's a pretty simple job description for a pastor. Preach the word, the whole council, and do it. Do it. So they see you do it. For 52 years of pastoral leadership, in three churches, four, if you count this one, it's two kinds of churches. David has n never brought any reproach upon you or me or Christ ever. No small thing. He has spoken the word of God. He has lived the word of God. And many of us have been inspired to imitate I think verse eight is attached to verse seven for a reason. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What's the point? The point is a turnover of leadership is never a turnover of lordship. They come and go. Pastors come and go not Jesus. So when I'm telling you to look back on some pastors you loved, elders that you loved and you respected, and you wish you could have been with them forever, when you look back on them, don't idealize anything and don't romanticize anything. Get your eyes up, get your eyes up. Jesus never changes. He's never leaving, right? Never switches churches. <laughs> That's good news. Verse 17. These are present. These are not dead. These are not gone. These leaders are here. Obey your leaders. Submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls. As those who will have to give an account for that soul care. Let them do this with joy <laughs> and not with groaning. For that, a, a life of pastoral groaning would be of no advantage to you. Now, that's, there are two halves to this verse. The basic idea of the first half is South City's Church, when your elders, your pastors, bring forward a prayed over, thought over, thought through proposal, vision, plan. Let your first response be 
support, not suspicion. That's what that verse means, at least. Now we know, we know that all biblical relationships of authority and submission are not absolute. We know this, we don't need to linger over this. I'm thinking government and citizen, husband and wife, parent and child, master and servant, and pastor and people. Those are the, the five big authority structures in the Bible. And every one of them is relativized by the superior authority of Jesus. We all know this. Like, if your husband asks you to sin, you don't sin, wives. And so, right across the board. Whatever you think, you think we should obey man, we must obey God, Acts chapter 5. However, the world that we live in is so anti-authoritarian and submission-oriented that they reject the fact that God has put these, these structures in place for society and for our churches, for the health of the churches, the love of the churches, the good of the people, and we should be glad. That's the first half of the verse. Second half of the verse is, is juicy. It's just delicious for people and pastors. Let the leaders do this. Do all this work of soul watch care. Do all this preaching and all this counseling and all this visiting and all this vision casting. Let them do all of this with joy. He's telling you, you, South City's church, to do what you can do to make that happen. Right? That's what it says. Let your pastors, enable your pastors, help your pastors to be happy, happy in their work. That's juicy. I love this. I always loved this. I always was happy at Bethlehem. I mean, there were unhappy times. But I was surrounded, and David was surrounded by elders who were so consistently supportive and caring and loving and theologically on the same page and pulling together that whatever negative and hard things were happening, we made it and the joy was restored. It's been a happy season, hasn't it? Let the leaders do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So the job of South City's church is to gladden the hearts of the pastors, and the motive is so that you will get the advantage of their happy ministry. That's what it says. It's Christian hedonism through and through. A sullen pastor, picture him, a sullen pastor, a groaning pastor, oh, the the work is hard, oh, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, (laughs) will be of no advantage to his people. That's a pretty strong statement. Unhappy pastors make unhealthy churches, they just do. Which means that if you, if I now, sitting in my pew at at that downtown campus, if we want to be a healthy people, a happy people, we must labor for the joy of our pastors. So, David, thank you for speaking the word of God to your people to Olivet and Elkhorn and Bethlehem and South City's Church, in season, out of season, big groups, small groups, one-on-one. Thank you that the outcome of your faith is 52 years of ministry unsullied by moral failure of any kind that would bring reproach upon the people of God. 
you have never brought disrepute on the gospel. Your stability and constancy in Christ is worthy of imitation. And I thank you for being a glad pastor, a happy partner in the work. You want to hear a couple of guys laugh? Come to a birthday party on January 13. I'm two days older than that old man. <laughs> I'm the senior pastor. <laughs> Always been the senior pastor. But we do our birthdays together, and man, it is a happy time. 50 years almost, friendship. 1974, they're in the AC Lounge at Bethel. You've been a rock of happy constancy for me and my ups and downs. I'm, I'm a very volatile person. Okay. David's a rock. I mean, you may be up and down too, but it doesn't show like it shows here. I can be really down and I can be really up and it is so good to have a friend who's a rock. You've been a glad shepherd. You've made me healthier in the ministry and in my marriage. Yes, Ministry and marriage, you've made me healthier. And you've been a glad pastor and shepherd here at South City's Church from the beginning. And we together thank you. The other text, verse 24, I can do in one sentence. Greet your leaders. That's why we're doing today. Today is an obedience to that. In the next couple hours, we will... Greet David and Karen, and we will say, well done. We greet you in the name of Jesus. So as we turn to the table, the Lord's table, before I pray, just let your mind go back to the middle point of the message. Jesus bought this life with his blood. So Father, as we make our transition now to remember with the bread and the cup that you died for us, Jesus. Oh, assure us that the promises will be kept and that the freedom will be given and the fear will be taken away and we can live this Christ-exalting, crazy, radical Christian life. I assist in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.